Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Today's program is part of our MGHFC Parenting Series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General Hospital for Children. Before I get started, just wanted to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in doing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that everyone is in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use the chat feature, which is located above your screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff, co host and guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat box. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. So next, I would like to hand it over to Brianna Beckfold. She is the project manager and editor for Mass General Hospital for Children, and she will introduce you all today's guest speaker. Great, thank you, Amy. So good afternoon, I hope you're all doing well, and thanks for coming to this virtual session of the MGHFC Parenting Series, where experts share their knowledge with patients, family, and staff on various pediatric health topics. And this year, we're co-hosting the series with the Blum Patient and Family Learning Center at Mass General. My name is Brianna Beckbold, and I'm a project manager and editor at Mass General Hospital for Children, which is the pediatric branch of Mass General. And in recognition of National Injury Prevention Day today, we have Dr. Michael Flaherty as our guest speaker to talk about distracted driving. So before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Flaherty cares for infants, children, uh, teens, and young adults in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit here at MGHFC. He's a leading researcher in the field of pediatric injury prevention and epidemiology. He grew up in North Andover, Massachusetts and attended Emanuel College in Boston where he obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in biology and chemistry. He earned his medical degree from the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine in Biddeford, Maine and returned here to Massachusetts to complete his res residency in pediatrics at the Bay State Medical Center and Tufts University program. During residency, he became interested in pediatric injury prevention research and he was part of the first group to study graduated driver licensing for the prevention of adolescent motor vehicle fatalities in Massachusetts. He completed his fellowship in pediatric critical care medicine here at Mass General, where he became involved with the trauma and injury prevention outreach program, and he is now the co-director of that program. He stayed on as faculty at MGHFC, where he continues research efforts in pediatric trauma and injury prevention and has active interests in medical education. His clinical interests include the care of critically ill children in all capacities and specifically in the medical treatment of pediatric trauma victims and uh, treatment of severe refractory asthma. So as Dr. Flaherty presents, we'll be taking questions from the audience in the chat box. And from here, I will hand it off to Dr. Flaherty. Thank you so much, Brianna, and thank you, Amy, as well. Um, I'm so honored and grateful to the Blum Center to be able to be here today um, to talk a little bit about the teen driver and, and ways we can think about the unique challenges uh, that our teenagers face as they learn to drive and, and enter our roads. Just going to go ahead and share my presentation. Great. You see that okay? Awesome. So as Brianna mentioned, um, my clinical um, capacity here at Mass General is, is as a pediatric critical care specialist um, in the PICU, uh, which is on Bigelow 6. Um, there I take care of patients for a range of, of different um, reasons, but one of those reasons is trauma and injury, which happens to be the, the leading cause of death in our patient population. And in particular, motor vehicle crashes um, present a unique challenge to our teens. And so I'm hopeful today to present some statistics, um, some methods, some strategies that we can all do as communities, as parents, as pediatricians, as educators, um, to try to, to protect our teen drivers as best as we possibly can. Um, I don't have any disclosures, uh, no financial or conflicts of interest related to this presentation. I'm gonna talk about some subscription services um, and apps um, that I have no financial interest in um, and, or no collaboration with. Um, uh, and, and we can go over those in more detail later. Um, as Brianna mentioned, today is the second annual National Injury Prevention Day. 
this was a day that began um, through an organization called the Injury Free Coalition for Kids, of which Mass General for Children is now a member. Um, it is a day where trauma centers and pediatric hospitals across the country um, gather to highlight injury as a leading cause of, of death and injury um, to our patients and to talk about um, different strategies, different ways that we can impact um, this, this public health issue. Um, here at Mass General this year, um, teen driving, distracted driving, driving in all forms um, has been our topic. And so part of this presentation uh, will go along with that. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of things today um, and I'm hopeful to be able to answer specific questions um, at the end, but um, a big overview. So I'm gonna talk a lot about statistics, um, the reasons that we, we care about this issue and why it's become um, such an important issue for me uh, as someone who takes care of critically ill children. We're gonna talk about some unique risks. Um, we all have risks when we get in a vehicle and, and enter our roadways, but teens in particular um, are unique and we'll talk about reasons why. We'll also talk about potential solutions that people have come up with, um, the evidence around them, and not only what those solutions are, but how we can implement them, what we can do um, as healthcare professionals, as parents, as teachers, um, to try to implement these solutions um, in and around our roadways and for our teen drivers. So the teen license, I've got pictures here of, of one of the most important days that many of us remember, that day that we obtained our driver's license. It's a milestone um, in adolescence. It's um, a, a symbol of freedom, of autonomy. Um, it allows teens to get to and from school, to get to after school programs and sports. And it frees up parents to not have to arrange carpools or find rides uh, and to be able to do their own things. But it's also a time of extreme stress, not only for teens who are taking the licenses, who enter roads at a time where uh, the number of drivers out there is at its highest, um, but for parents um, who have to lead their teens through this process and for healthcare professionals who are um, sort of faced with how to best help parents and teenagers navigate this process and do the best we can to protect them. Um, so sort of a, a bittersweet event um, for all of us. So let's go over some statistics. Um, and some of these will be um, a little gloomy and some will be a little more um, optimistic. So it's not all doom and gloom. But the reasons we're talking about this today are that new drivers, uh, and in particular, a new driver is someone with less than 18 months of experience. They have about four times the risk of a crash or near crash event, which is pretty substantial if you think about it. Additionally, per mile driven, 16 and 17 year old drivers, so the youngest of those who are able to be licensed in this country, have the highest rates of crash involved. Um, and these injuries aren't just to themselves as drivers. These are injuries to people who are passengers in their vehicles um, and to pedestrians, to bicyclists, people outside the vehicle um, also continue um, to have a high rate of crash involvement with teen drivers. Um, this is evidenced by the fact that more than half of eight to 17 year olds who are unfortunately killed as passengers were actually being driven by someone who was under the age of 18. This is a slide I show in many of my presentations to parents, to other clinicians, um, and it shows a little bit about why I do what I do. Outside of my clinical role in the ICU, my passion is, is for preventing pediatric injury and preventing trauma. And this is a chart from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, that looks at leading causes of death. Um, and 2018 is the most recent year where this data is available. And you'll note in blue uh, is unintentional injury. And from a range of about one year all the way up to 44 years of age, unintentional injury is the leading cause of death in the United States, uh, which is really alarming. If we zoom in a little bit more to figure out what are the leading causes of, of unintentional injury death, um, we see, again, in light blue, are unintentional motor vehicle traffic deaths. So those are motor vehicle crashes. And there's really a sort of a bimodal distribution. So five to nine-year-olds, and then again, 15 to 24-year-olds, um, which corresponds to an age where many people are first becoming licensed drivers and going out on the road. Um, and then motor vehicle crash deaths continue basically throughout the lifespan as the second leading cause of death in this country. Uh, again, pointing to the importance of having these conversations and thinking about ways that we can prevent this uh, in so many different forms and capacities. This is a chart that shows uh, a comparison of both high-income countries and low-to-middle-income countries um, for deaths from motor vehicle 
crashes. And you'll see that for high income countries, the United States uh, is disproportionately represented in a, in a negative way um, in terms of the number of deaths we have for motor vehicle crashes. Um, and we outpace just about every other high income country. And there are again, lots of different reasons for that. And we can discuss that in further detail. But it is not all doom and gloom, as I mentioned. Um, if you look at this graph, um, these are mortality rates, so deaths per 100,000 children and adolescents for the top leading causes of death in the United States. And it's from 1999 to 2016. And obviously this light blue line here stands out among all of the rest, such that a lot of other things it looks like we've had no impact in, even though we have made dramatic impacts in other causes of death to children. But motor vehicle crashes in particular over the last decade, there's been about a 50% reduction in deaths um, from motor vehicle crashes in our teens and adolescents. That's really reassuring and that, that helps us look back and try to figure out what are we doing well and what things are working. And so if we think a little bit about this and some of the, the things that people have studied is that one, overall traffic related deaths are going down. So obviously if all traffic related deaths decrease, those who are at highest risk or greatest impacted um, are also going to, to have um, benefits from that. So our teen drivers are seeing benefits to overall traffic related deaths going down. Additionally, there have been a number of safety improvements and these improvements range from uh, technological marvels within vehicles themselves. So the advent of, of secure seatbelts, of airbags, of other vehicle occupant safety systems and technology that help keep um, cars, drivers, and passengers safe. Um, and also on our roads, we have um, improved roads, we have improved um, traffic safety laws, um, lots of different improvements in terms of safety. One of the other things I'll talk a lot about today is something called graduated driver licensing or GDL. Um, and GDL has been a, a huge um, plus to our, our teen drivers. And we'll talk a little bit about what graduated driver licensing is and why that's been so helpful, particularly for novice drivers. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention also that fewer teens are driving. So less numbers of teens out on the road, less teens getting their license, obviously fewer crashes. Um, and so that's good and bad. It's good in that um, you know, fewer teens are driving and put them, putting themselves at risk, but it also blurs the picture a little bit to have a better understanding of what we can do to protect those who do opt to drive and who do get their their driver's licenses and, and rely on vehicles as their primary mode of transportation. And so I bring the chart up again. Um, so we did a little, little bit of optimism there. We've had a 50% reduction in deaths, but you'll note that the tail end of that light blue line at the top is starting to head in the wrong direction again. And we've seen that from about 2013 on, while we've had really great strides and improvements um, in the numbers of deaths from teens, um, they're starting to go up again. And there are a lot of different reasons why that is, but one of the, the big reasons um, is the new advent of distracted driving. And while distraction was always present, while we always uh, needed to be concerned about things that would distract drivers from the road, um, now more than ever, cell phones, um, new technology and vehicles have presented uh, new methods uh, for, for all of us being victim to, to distraction from the road. Um, and so a lot of motor vehicle crash safety and research now is targeting distracted driving and how we can impact that. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go on in the presentation. This unfortunately um, is a list of different headlines from texting and driving and distracted driving just here in Massachusetts alone, um, where um, you know, teenagers have certainly uh, been disproportionately impacted by the, the negative effects of distracted driving and, and harm that's come to both drivers uh, and to pedestrians. Um, and there have been several landmark legal cases that have looked at um, how to best handle this from a legal perspective and in a liability perspective. So let's switch gears a little bit. Now that we've, we've seen these alarming numbers uh, and understand what a big problem this truly is, um, now let's talk about the whys. What are some of the risk factors um, for teens in particular to have a higher uh, risk of, of a crash um, or a death in a motor vehicle. And this helps us to identify ways that we can improve things. If we know the risk factors, we can target interventions to try to, to decrease those risks. Um, and I'm gonna go through each of these in, in detail, but obviously inexperience is one. So you don't have as much experience driving, um, it's, it's gonna lead to, to a greater uh, risk of, of a crash uh, or a near crash event. 
Um, passengers are a big risk factor, having anybody in the vehicle with you. Risky driving, so speeding, um, following too closely, um, driving erratically, risky driving is a, is a risk factor. Distraction, um, as I previously had mentioned. Substance use, while we've made significant um, headway in, remains, um, a, a, an, remains a, an etiology in a large percentage of, of crashes, especially those uh, related to teen drivers. And then there are a variety of medical concerns um, that different teens and adolescent drivers may have that, that put them at a higher risk. And it's really important to identify what those are so that we can target those teens uh, specifically. So let's talk a little bit about inexperience. Um, and one is uh, attention and risk. So the adolescent brain is still developing. It's still learning how to process all of the input that it's getting from around it. And I'm sure the parent of any teen can attest to that fact, even outside of driving and in everyday life. Opinions are being formed. The world is being experienced in new ways. Um, and, and children are now adolescents learning to be more autonomous. This manifests itself in, in cognitive tasks and tasks we have to think about. Um, and the teen driver and the adolescent brain tend to focus on one thing at a time. So they can see that one hazard in front of them, but they're really unable to anticipate everything else around them. The more experience we have, the more our brains develop, the more we're able to think ahead um, and to not only focus on one thing, but to actually think about our periphery and all of the, the things, the people, the pedestrians, the other cars around us that may, um, may get us into trouble. And so the adolescent brain inherently and biologically is just not really good at that. The other is delayed licensing. So as new laws come out, um, many of these laws are restricted to certain ages. And so some teens are delaying getting their licenses until later on in life. Um, and that reduces experience. Um, and it also sometimes reduces teens exposure to programs that are available to younger drivers that might not be available to them if they wait until they're 19 or 20 uh, to get a license. Um, opportunities for practice are really important. You know, um, you can't have experience if you start at the age of 16. And so you need to have as many scenarios to practice in as, as possible. And we'll talk about how parents can play a huge role in that. Passengers was another big risk factor. So passengers by themselves increase the risk of a crash um, through lots of different mechanisms. But the two main are distraction, having someone next to you or behind you talking to you um, is a distraction to anybody who's driving, and in particular, a, a new driver. There's also peer influence. Teen, uh, teens want to, um, they want to impact and, and, and show off to their peers. They want to, um, to give in to peer pressure. And so having someone in the car um, may make a teen driver more apt to, to do things or take more risks than they might be willing to do if they're by themselves. Um, unfortunately, research has shown that the likelihood of a teen driver being involved in a fatal crash is actually directly related to the number of passengers. And so there is a, an effect to having more than one. Um, the more number of passengers in the vehicle, the more distractions there are, the more likely it is that a teen driver is going to be involved in a collision. And that's why um, many laws and many training forums um, target passengers uh, as a means to, to reducing risk. Um, this effect is unfortunately much stronger in, in male teen drivers. Um, we have found in, in a variety of different studies. And then there's risky driving, which um, even adults are, are prone to doing. But teens in particular um, are more likely by the numbers and by a retrospective look at crashes that teens have been involved in to speed. Um, and speed is, is, a number, is, is a factor in a number of crashes. And among those in which someone in that vehicle died, speed was implicated in, in almost a third of those crashes. We know that new drivers are also unfortunately um, prone to maintaining shorting following distances, shorter following distances. They, they tailgate, they follow closer. They're not as aware um, of how, how much distance there may need to be to stop a vehicle, especially in different weather conditions. Nighttime driving is a particular risk. Unfortunately, uh, teens, their social lives um, revolve around nighttime things. Um, whether that be social events or, you know, after school events or sporting events, a lot of their driving is disproportionately in the evening. Um, and a nighttime driver, there are all sorts of, of new things that, that are added to the equation when you add in darkness and, and all of the factors that impact uh, driving at night. 
Um, we have had, and I'll show some videos soon, um, the benefit of having many insurance companies in driving safety uh, organizations who have been able to put technology in vehicles to look at kinematic behaviors. That's the study of movement. What is the vehicle doing at any given time? And we know that when we look at these kinematic or movement systems in the vehicles of teen drivers, they're all over the place. Teens are far more, um, far more at risk of taking quick turns, of stopping more abruptly, um, of turning the vehicle at a higher rate of speed, um, all things which um, create issues um, and make driving slightly riskier. And then there's distraction. Um, as I mentioned, distraction has now topped the list as one of the leading risk factors for teen drivers. There are traditionally three forms of distraction that we think about um, with any task that we complete, but in particular with driving. There's visual, so there's distractions around us that we can see. There's distractions on driver interface screens. We have new vehicles with these large screens that, um, that do things and move and can distract our eyes away from the road. There's manual distraction. Um, that is actually physically doing something, eating food, picking something up, dropping something in the vehicle and going to pick it up. Things that we do manually, physically with our, with our hands. And then there's cognitive distraction, which is becoming a, a, a more well-established um, type of distraction where our brains are thinking about different things. And even though we may not have something directly in front of us, or we may not be reaching for something, we might be thinking about something or doing another task with our brains that takes um, our attention away from the road. There's no greater example of that than with hands-free cell phones. Um, and we'll talk about um, different laws and hands-free devices. But even though you're not physically holding that phone up, um, it still requires cognition, it, thinking about it. Actually having a conversation is a distraction, even if that phone uh, is not to someone's ear or in front of someone's face. Um, electronic devices by themselves present all three types of distraction. You can pick a mobile electronic device or a cell phone up. You can look at it. Um, you can think about what's on there or see a text that, that causes your brain to go places it shouldn't when it should be focusing on the road ahead. And so this has presented uh, a whole new level of, of worry for um, injury researchers and motor vehicle traffic uh, researchers. Alarming statistics is that when, when surveyed, teens, um, almost half of them admit that they've used a cell phone um, in the past three months. There is a, a large survey called the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that gets administered to high school students. Um, and during several iterations of that survey through the years, uh, by and far, teens anonymously will report that they have actually text messaged while driving, uh, even in the last month. And so it's something they're doing, even if we think they're not or they're saying they're not. The strongest predictor of crash risk with a distraction uh, happens to be the duration or the visual glance away from the road. So common sense, the longer you're looking away, the more prone you are to losing focus on that road um, and creating a collision or a dangerous situation for yourself and the people around you. Um, greater than two seconds. So it may seem like, you know, you can adjust that uh, climate control system or it's okay if I, I reroute my GPS just for a second, but actually two seconds um, is enough time to increase your risk of a crash. Greater than two seconds, almost a five-fold increased risk uh, in crashing. So it does not take long um, in terms of your eyes being off the road for um, someone to be at risk um, for crashing. So this is a video that I'm going to show. I'm going to show just a portion of it. Um, I will give you a disclaimer. It's a little bit alarming. Um, these are um, this is video footage from from AAA where they placed cameras, both dashboard cams and driver cams um, in the vehicles of teens. And they abstracted um, about 12 of them where there was a near crash event. So none of these videos are of teens that were ultimately in a crash, but it shows some really dangerous conditions and really dangerous uh, techniques that, that teens are doing um, that have presented them at risk. So I'm gonna play this for a moment and just show you all of the different ways uh, that teens are distracted from the road. So in this one, we've got lots of examples. This driver is looking at a phone, is listening to music, and nearly loses control. Here we have manual distraction, applying lipstick. 
seconds glancing away from the road. And you'll note that she looked back before it even happened. This is texting while driving. Again, that was less than a second. Picking up the phone and looking at it, less than one second. In this case, we have inclement weather added to talking on a cell phone. Fast forward a bit. To this one, this is passengers. Looking at the passenger for just a second. Stop short. So not to, to be dramatic or to make parents even more concerned, but this is happening and we're now able to see it with new technology um, and know that, you know, you think that you can look away from the road for moments, but less than, less than a second uh, is all it takes uh, to have to have your brain refocus on driving and to put yourself at risk. Um, impaired driving. So we mentioned impaired driving. So substance uh, use, so alcohol being one. We've made huge improvements, um, especially with the 1984 federal law in the United States that increased the, uh, the age at which someone can purchase alcohol to 21. So that actually saw a dramatic decline in alcohol-related uh, traffic deaths. Um, but still, it becomes implicated in a number of, of crashes. And teens overall have a higher risk of motor vehicle crashes at any blood alcohol content compared with older drivers. Um, so especially in Massachusetts, um, any blood alcohol level uh, is, is against the law for a new driver. There is no minimum blood alcohol level. There is no safe amount of alcohol that a teen or new driver can consume that doesn't put them at increased risk of a crash. Marijuana. Marijuana has created another new problem uh, as it's been, become legalized in many states. Um, and it's difficult to test for, it's difficult to know about. And so we're still learning more about the impacts of, of marijuana related intoxication and what that means for teen drivers, even though many of these laws um, begin at the age of 18 or even 21, um, they're still more available. Um, marijuana has been shown by itself to increase one's crash risk by about 1.21 times. And again, as I mentioned, difficult to study. Prescription drugs are, are another source of impaired driving. Many of these drugs are being appropriately used and being used under uh, the instructions and direction of, of healthcare professionals. Uh, but it's important to know which of these drugs can influence or impair one's ability to drive and ensure that uh, we find ways around that. And then lastly, we'll talk about medical conditions as a risk. Um, ADHD is a big one. Um, so a lot of teens who struggle with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And we know from um, very high quality research that teen drivers with ADHD have higher crash risks. Uh, but this allows us to identify those who have ADHD um, and be able to refine their medication and behavioral um, therapy recommendations before they get their license and to, to ensure that they have more practice in that uh, we spend just a little bit more time thinking about what driving looks like for someone who struggles with attention issues. We're also learning more about sports related concussions as these become more prevalent, that even one concussion can impact your ability to concentrate and to focus. Um, and what that means for teens who suffered a, a concussion um, recently who are then on the roads. And then there are the obvious medical conditions, epilepsy being a big one. So seizures, uh, most states have laws that anyone who's had a seizure recently is, is unable to drive for a set amount of time, um, but it remains a risk factor. Diabetes, so um, teens who um, require insulin, who may become hypo or hyperglycemic, um, have higher low blood sugars, um, this can certainly impact their ability to drive safely on the roads. And so all of these things, um, again, sort of help us flag those teens who we have to pay a little more attention to um, and have a little more care and thought around what it's gonna look like for them as they learn to drive and transition to independent driving. 
So now the, the beneficial part, what, what can we do? So we're gonna talk here about um, things that are evidence-based, um, founded in research, that we as a community, as parents, as pediatricians, as healthcare professionals, um, as teachers can all do to try to get rid of all of the risks that we just discussed. So all of these things present an opportunity um, for us to educate people about, for us to pass laws about, and for us to implement uh, in terms of how we educate teens in driving. So we talked about graduated driver licensing um, very briefly. It is probably the most important advancement uh, in teen driving safety in the last 25 years. So graduated driver licensing began in New Zealand and then it made its way to the United States in the mid to late 1990s. Um, and it is now present in some form in just about in, in all states in the United States. So every state has some form of graduated driver licensing, which is really a huge accomplishment. And what it is, is as the name sort of implies, it's a, it's a graduated process into practicing and then slowly introducing a new driver into independent driving. And it's typically marked by a, a supervised driving period um, what we would call in Massachusetts as a learner's permit, where someone is allowed to drive, but they have to be with someone of a, um, a minimum age and who has a driver's license and who is present in the seat next to them throughout all interactions and during certain periods of time. So the learner permit period, period of a very close supervision and monitoring. The graduation goes up to now being able to obtain a license, but having a probationary or intermediate period. In Massachusetts, this is known as a junior, junior operator license. And this is a period of time uh, in which there are certain restrictions that try to reduce risky driving scenarios for teens. Um, again, we try to reduce high risk exposure. The probationary periods usually impact nighttime driving. Um, so restrictions on when teens can drive uh, and the number and or presence at all of passengers in a vehicle. Um, this is, um, I'm going to show you the Massachusetts learner's permit restrictions. Um, so learner's permit period, generally 15 and a half is when someone can get a learner's permit in Massachusetts. Um, they can't drive between midnight and 5 a.m. unless accompanied by a parent or legal guardian. Um, they can't operate in any other state if it's a violation of that state's um, law. Um, they must have it on them when driving um, and they can't carry uh, any passengers and can operate uh, after sunset or before sunrise. Um, so these are the learner's permit restrictions. When we progress to a junior operator law or license in Massachusetts, um, teens are then allowed to drive by themselves without a supervised driver. However, they're not allowed to have passengers for at least six months. And again, they're not allowed to be driving for the first six months between midnight and 5 a.m. Um, and these are all in, in an effort to, again, try to reduce exposure to, to high-risk situations. Not all GDL requirements are the same. So in Massachusetts, I mentioned that the nighttime restriction begins at midnight. Um, unfortunately, while we are one of the stronger GDL laws, research tells us that 9 a.m. is really the most effective period to start a driver's license restriction. Um, but that can impede social lives and, and can be quite um, difficult for, for a lot of teens and parents. Um, and so most states, it's somewhere between 10 and midnight. Um, restrictions on teen passengers. Most graduated driver licensing programs have some restriction um, anywhere from six months to a year where a new driver is not allowed to have passengers in the vehicle for all of the reasons uh, that we have previously mentioned. There's also a call to increase the minimum age at which a learner's permit or license can be obtained. Currently in the United States, most states, um, the youngest is 15. Many states have increased that to 16 or even 16 and a half uh, in which a driver can obtain a learner's permit. So that's graduated driver licensing. Um, and again, we have a, a fairly strong law here in Massachusetts. Um, and here at Mass General for Children, many of our researchers have looked at graduated driver licensing here in this state and have found a, an almost 40% reduction in, in fatal crashes um, involving teens when GDL was passed here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So it works. It's not popular among teen drivers. It's not popular among some parents, but definitely by reducing exposure and, and creating a graduated period to autonomous driving, there are beneficial effects to, to teens um, and to those around them who may be impacted by a crash. 
We also have driver education or driver's ed as it's colloquial known. Driver's ed is a requirement to get a license in Massachusetts and it's formal education on the rules of the road. It's designed, however, exclusively to help a teen pass a road test exam. So unfortunately, driver's education in, in any capacity or in any state has never really shown by itself to impact motor vehicle crash rates or make it any safer for that teen to drive. Um, it does help them pass the test, um, but it's important to recognize that, that there are more strategies that need to be employed than just sending a new driver to driver's ed. And finally, legislation. Um, we have laws that are better um, and they work. So graduated driver licensing being one, as well as seatbelt laws. Um, seatbelt laws are now present in every state in the United States, but they can be enforced in different ways. So they can be primary where someone, a uh, law enforcement uh, official can pull you over if they see you not wearing a seatbelt or a secondary law where you can only be cited or ticketed if you've been pulled over for another offense. Um, in Massachusetts, believe it or not, we still don't have a primary seatbelt law there is uh, just a secondary enforced law. But we know from good data, again, that primary seatbelt laws actually save lives. There's also a number of distracted driving laws, and I'm gonna go over that very briefly. We conducted a study here at Mass General in collaboration um, with one of my research mentors, Dr. Lois Lee at Boston Children's Hospital, um, to look at driving laws, distracted driving laws across the United States and which ones work and which ones don't. Um, and there are a number of different types of laws that every state has employed. There are laws that exclusively call out texting, so where texting is banned. So, and they can also be primarily enforced, meaning someone can pull you over if they see you texting, or secondarily enforced. You were pulled over for some other um, infraction, and lo and behold, you also happen to be texting. Um, as you can imagine, these specific laws are difficult to enforce, because they allow for other reasons to use a phone. And so it's hard to prove that a driver was, was texting versus dialing a phone number, which in some states is allowed under these laws. There are handheld cell phone bans in which um, a driver uh, cannot um, use any handheld device in their hand for all ages, um, but you still are able to use hands-free methods. So either speaker phone or using Bluetooth technology. And finally, there are all cell phone use bans that prohibit using a cell phone in any capacity, hands-free, speaker phone, to your, to your ear, in all forms. There's no state that has a, a complete cell phone use ban that applies to everyone. There are states that have these laws that apply to new drivers only. Um, so what did we find in this study? So this is just a, um, a chart to, to outline the increase in the number of these laws uh, just in the 10 years that we studied. So from 2007 to 2017, um, we went from just a handful of states, um, you know, five to 10 having some type of distracted driving law to fast forward to 2017 and now even in 2021, just about every state has adopted some form of distracted driving legislation and law but they're not all created equal. And, and so what we found when we looked at the youngest drivers, so this bar graph looks at 16 to 19 year olds and then our comparison group. So our middle-aged drivers, 40 to 55 year olds, um, these are motor vehicle crash fatalities per 100,000. So the higher that bar, the more people are dying. And what you see is that the, the smaller bar in, in just about every category are primary texting bands or um, the best um, bans on complete handheld cell phone use um, for all drivers. So across the board, again, this, this graph um, is the opposite. So the higher the bar, the better. So this is mortality reduction in different drivers um, and, and different law types. We see that in gray, handheld cell phone bans. So laws which um, mandate that you cannot hold a phone in a vehicle at any time for any reason, they work better. And common sense tells us that um, they're easier to enforce um, and they, they combat all three forms of distraction that we talked about, holding the phone, visual distraction, cognitive distraction. Um, but this was one of the first studies to actually prove that this legislation works and it works not only for all drivers, but specifically for, for teen drivers, those who are at the greatest risk of a, a distracted related fatality in a vehicle. It also works for passengers. We looked as part of our study at young passengers in cars. So anybody in a car from the age of 16 to 19. Um, and again, primary texting bans, 
um, they worked the best. So those where you could be pulled over mostly for texting um, had the biggest reduction in mortality. So they work for drivers, they work for passengers. Um, after this study was published, um, probably not exclusively related to it, but here in Massachusetts, we do now have a cell phone use ban, a handheld cell phone ban that went into effect um, two years ago this November, um, which was a huge step um, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So now let's talk about parent interventions. What can parents do? What can you do with your teen driver? By and far, the most important thing is being a role model. Children want to do what we do. And this starts at a very young age, as young as six months when you look at, um, at psychological studies. So we are um, who our teen drivers are going to emulate. What we do in a vehicle, they're gonna take note of even well before they obtain a driver's license. So parents need to practice their own safe driving. They need to not talk on a phone. They need to not use speakerphone or Bluetooth. Also monitoring and guidance. So as parents, we have the ultimate responsibility in helping introduce our teens to the road and helping introduce them to different situations and practice opportunities. And also monitoring what they do once they have a license. And we'll talk about some different ways uh, very shortly about um, as to how parents can do that safely. There are formal parent training programs. So in Massachusetts, there is a two hour mandated training course for any new driver um, that their parents have to take which helps with rules and laws of the road and learning the process. But there are also a variety of different formal parent training programs um, that help parents learn what are the best ways that I can teach my child to drive safely um, and also monitor them once they have a license and that we're not in the car with them. Um, and driver monitoring devices. Cell phones have done a lot of bad things uh, in terms of driving, but they've also opened up a whole new way in which parents can monitor their new drivers and help keep them safe. There was one study um, very recently that looked at a, a technique called precision prevention. And that basically is a tiered approach. That is all of the laws which states have really done a great job of enacting, but paired with tools that help our parents to support teen drivers. There's one called the Checkpoints Program, uh, which was created by the University of Michigan's Injury Prevention Center. It's a parent teen driving agreement. It's online, teens can do it on their cell phone. It helps parents talk to their teens about driving and it helps share decision-making. It's, it's a, a series of contracts that allow parents to talk to their kids about um, what's it gonna look like when you get the vehicle? When are you gonna be able to drive? What's it gonna look like if you don't do everything that we've talked about or you, um, you do get yourself into trouble driving? Um, and it really has been shown in, in several studies to reduce risky driving. This is just a, an example of what the format looks like where um, on a mobile device or a computer, um, parents can sort of document checkpoints where they've reviewed different driving rules based on their state rules, what their own rules are as parents, uh, especially if, if they're giving a child access to a vehicle in the home. And what are the consequences going to be? You know, no one wants to wait for, um, for breaking the law or for the police. So what are the consequences that parents are going to talk about? And, and it allows them to document it in one place so that um, there's a place to, to go back if a, if a teen driver doesn't. Uh, abide by what the rules are. There's also a variety of apps out there. So Life360 um, is one, and there'll be a list of these at the end of my talk. These are applications that parents can install on their phone, and they come with devices known as dongles. Dongles are these little devices that plug into um, a computer port that every car has. It's where um, inspection stations plug their computers in to check vehicle emissions. They plug into the car and they can basically extract data in real time from a vehicle. So these apps allow parents to monitor the speed at which their children are driving, whether the vehicle is sensing kinematic movements, movements that imply someone is following too closely, starting, stopping um, too abruptly, um, and also can monitor the teen's phone to see if they've used it in any capacity. Um, there's one called Mama Bear, um, which actually provides real-time alerts to parents if it detects that a child is using their phone or a teen, I suppose, is using their phone um, while they're driving and while it senses that they're in a vehicle. Um, it allows parents to set speed limits or what that speed is gonna be by, for which they get a notification that they can go back and, and review with their new teen drivers. Um, it also allows for arrival and departure notifications. So a whole new uh, element to calling me when you get there. Um, it, it tells you when they get there. 
Um, Drive Smart is another one that not only um, allows notifications, but also assigns a score based on how well teams are driving. Um, this is, is used by several insurance companies for all drivers to help with insurance rates. Um, the bottom line is these programs allow us, you know, very important access to teen drivers. Some teens, some parents see it as an invasion of privacy. Um, the argument is pediatricians and public health professionals um, is that, you know, driving is a skill, it's a privilege. Um, and this is not so much, um, you know, wanting to hold their hand or invade their privacy. It's helping them to be better drivers. It's, it's another step um, at monitoring and, and collaborating at safe driving conditions um, as they progress to being completely independent drivers. And just as you wouldn't let your toddler, as they learn to walk, roam the house, you know, unsupervised, um, without any instruction or um, review from a parent or someone in the home, um, you really probably, we shouldn't be letting our teens do the same thing when we, we let them out on the road for the first time. Um, and so it really has given us new strategies um, to help as parents with drivers um, who are, are first licensed. So what's our role as pediatricians? How can we help you as parents? So one, it's again, reinforcing that parents driving, their behavior, they are the single most important factor um, in what their, their children are going to do when they become drivers. So not using a phone when you're in the car for any purpose, um, using your seatbelt all the time, being a role model for, for your children starting very early and, and especially as, as they're starting to learn to drive. We have to help parents identify teenagers who are at particularly increased risk. So those that have acute or chronic medical problems um, and help partner with parents. Um, and parents should ask their pediatricians what they could do so they can pay special attention um, to setting their children up for success when they become drivers. And also just knowing what the laws are um, in each state and knowing um, what to counsel our parents and teens on uh, in terms of, of what to do and what's not allowed um, in, in every particular state. Um, avoiding distracted driving, responsible use of technology, um, one, two, and three in my book. Um, I am a distracted driving researcher. And so again, not using a phone, even hands-free or Bluetooth um, at any time when driving is, is really important. Um, and we as pediatricians should be counseling our adolescents on continued use of seatbelts, on avoiding alcohol or illicit substances, on reviewing what medications may impact their ability to drive. And as parents, we need to, to consistently be asking um, our pediatricians, our family medicine physicians, um, uh, our healthcare professionals, um, what can we do um, to, to better counsel our, our teens? Can you have this discussion with them um, separate from parents so that someone else is reiterating all of the things as parents that we're trying to teach our children. And finally, encouraging parents as best as possible to practice, practice, practice driving their teenagers in a variety of environments. As, you know, as many years as it takes off of your life, the more practice our teens can, can get with, with parents in the car, the better they're going to do, the better they're going to be able to handle these scenarios when they're by themselves. And so there are a lot of minimum hours that states specify um, in Massachusetts, I think it's close to 40 hours. It's probably not enough. Um, the more practice they can get, the better. Uh, and we as parents, we have a, a duty to help um, get that practice in above and beyond what driver's education courses or what states mandate um, so that our, our teen drivers are set up for success. So I'm gonna wrap things up a little bit. You know, driving is a skill. Um, it's learned, it requires experience, it requires practice. But it's not only skill, it's a privilege. Um, and we as pediatricians, as healthcare professionals, as parents, we need to monitor that privilege. We need to make it a, a shared privilege so that our teen drivers know what our expectations are of them. And so that they're being safe, not only for themselves, but for all of the people out there in the car and around the vehicle um, who are at risk if they don't abide by, by laws um, or by safe driving standards. Teen drivers in particular, we're all at risk when we get in a car, but teen drivers face unique risks. So inexperience, risk-taking, distraction, sensitivity, more sensitivity to being impaired while driving and risky driving behaviors. And the adolescent brain is developing. It is not matured yet. It is not matured probably until our early 20s. And so that combined with all of the social and emotional pressures that are out there today um, influence uh, every teen's ability to appraise what risk there is in every situation or in that specific moment, what decisions they're gonna make. Um, and this is, this is something we need to be mindful of when we're teaching them to drive and think about all of, of the ways that we can reduce exposure to these risky, risky conditions. 
Um, we know that policies and programs, they work, laws work. Um, and we as healthcare professionals, as parents, need to continue to advocate to our state legislators um, for what we know works and what has evidence behind it in terms of protecting our teens while they're out on the road and protecting our pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, and all programs are dependent on active participation by parents. Nothing by itself um, is successful. Everything in, in conjunction with, with other things, it's a, it's, it requires um, a, a multi-pronged approach um, to help our teens. This is my inspiration. So full disclosure, I have a 15 month old, not a 15 year old. So I have some years to prepare for all of this. Um, she started a little bit early, but this is my daughter, Sivan, um, and my wife, Danielle, who consistently serve as the inspiration um, as well as all of the patients I take care of uh, each and every day here at Mass General for Children. Um, and I, I need to acknowledge the great work of, of all of the people who helped me in my career. So the Trauma and Injury Prevention Program here, um, Toby Raybold, Alice Gervasini, Laurie Petrovic, Peter Masiakos, um, the Pediatric Trauma Service here at Mass General who take care of, of the, um, the children um, when things don't go as well as we would hope. Um, my mentors um, at other hospitals in Boston, including Lois Lee at Boston Children's Hospital um, and their injury prevention group, and our own State Department of Public Health and AAA of New England, um, who have been great partners um, with all of, of the, the good work that we're working on here each and every day. Um, here are some resources that are particularly helpful for parents um, with uh, different strategies that we talked about today. And I'm happy to share my email address if anyone wants to reach out um, about any of the apps that I talked about or any of the strategies um, that I reviewed today. And with that, I am I'm happy to open it up to some questions. Thank you so much. Um, as always, very informative. Um, so we do have one question that's come through. Um, so it says anecdotally, uh, this is from a provider here at the hospital, um, it seems we've been seeing more marijuana positive young drivers in recent years. What is our obligation or restriction to dealing with this uh, finding when an adolescent presents with a positive screen and was driving? Yeah, um, I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, marijuana has presented a unique challenge because um, at least for those of a certain age, it has been legalized in many states. We are finding now that we're testing more for it by virtue of, of laws and by virtue of better testing. Um, it's very difficult to test for and, and often there are many substances that become positive um, during a motor vehicle crash. I think our shared message is that any substance that we're using while driving, marijuana, alcohol, um, prescription drugs that we know can impact one's cognition, they're not okay to use when driving. And so if, if we do find um, that a teen has been positive, especially after the fact, um, when they've been involved in a crash, I, I think it's our duty as healthcare professionals um, to remind them that um, you should not be under the influence of anything when driving a vehicle, that there's a huge responsibility that comes with that. And part of that responsibility is, is not using substances. Um, okay, our next question is, of the apps that you mentioned in the presentation, is there one that you would recommend? So I tried to pick out, there are so many out there. I think the one that I didn't mention, first and foremost, is in most phones, there is a do not disturb feature. Um, Apple devices, Android devices, um, all have the ability to turn on a feature where the phone can recognize when you're in a car and not let alerts come through. And that's a free feature that I wish uh, was the default alt uh, on every phone that we actually had to actively turn off. But that is what I would recommend universally. I use it in my own phone. Um, I make my wife use it when she drives, my family. Um, put your phone on do not disturb and, and that will just prevent that temptation we have. Even if you're using your phone as a GPS to see a text come through or a phone call come through while it senses we're driving. Um, while there are hundreds of apps out there, the, the three that I mentioned, so the Life360, um, Mama Bear, those are the, the two that time and time again seem to be the most robust. Unfortunately, many of these apps cost money, um, and a lot of them have, have some free features, but for all of the features, there's a subscription fee. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head how much each of them costs, but that is, is obviously a factor in deciding which will work best. Um, but those three that I, I discussed, the Life360, the Mama Bear, and the Skills Coach um, are the ones I would recommend um, above and beyond turning your phone on do not disturb mode. Great. Um, okay, our next question. Are there any new driving law proposals being considered to keep teen drivers and everyone on the road safe? Yeah. So, you know, 
Fortunately, Massachusetts just passed a handheld cell phone ban. So here in that state, um, we're hopeful that that's going to impact um, our numbers here. It's a little, uh, a little soon to be able to look at that, but we'll be, um, our group here is interested in looking at that soon. Um, primary seatbelt laws, Massachusetts still doesn't have a primary seatbelt law. And that's something that our group and many groups across the state have worked really hard to try to implement. Um, you know, a lot of the new laws um, are going to be tied to what technology is available in new vehicles. And as we think about self-driving vehicles and different autonomous vehicle capabilities, um, I'm certain that new laws will come into place in, in terms of how to protect people. Um, one that's got a, a lot of publicity recently as part of the infrastructure bill that was just passed has called for um, alcohol detection devices in new vehicles that are being um, designed. Um, so a lot of different technology um, that's coming out there for good and, and for um, increasing risk. Um, but that's it. I don't know of any other um, you know, new laws that are on the table just yet. Okay. Um, what are some tips that you would give to teens to stay safe on the road? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I went through some of the things that we can do as pediatricians in, in those last couple of slides. Um, I think first and foremost, reminding them that driving is a responsibility. It, it, it's, um, it's a skill, it's a privilege. You are faced with a, a two-ton weapon. Um, and as part of that, um, it is our responsibility um, to ourselves and to all of the people out there on the road to make sure that we follow the rules of the road, to make sure that we follow state-specific laws, um, and to make sure that anything that might distract us in a vehicle is put away. Um, so, you know, I, I, I tell all of, all of my patients that, um, you know, GPS is great, um, but really, we shouldn't even really be looking at a GPS when driving. We should be outlining our routes in advance or using GPS systems that may be able to speak out loud but trying to remove any extraneous things in a car that detract from, from driving, especially when you're first learning. Um, and to listen to, our, to their parents. You know, parents have been driving, many of them, for many, many years, um, and they know best. And, and it has to be a, a collaboration so that everybody is safe on the road and so that teens learn um, sequentially with experience to become responsible and, and skilled drivers. Okay, great. Um... We have about two minutes left. So if anyone has any other questions, please be sure to put them in the chat box now. Um, and if not, then I think we can wrap up a minute or two early. Well, thank you so, so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you to the Blum Center for, for this opportunity um, and for everyone who was able to join today. Um, I hope that together we're, we're able to, to impact um, our teens out there on the road and, and help make things just a little bit safer for them. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. And as I had mentioned earlier, if you're interested in viewing the recording of today's session, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. That'll be made available there. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you.